you are now experiencing the, 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 the Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. Hey everybody, welcome to the Digital Life. On today's show, I talk analytics and online privacy with April Wilson. Now I'm a big fan of April Wilson. Not only because she loves the comic book character Wonder Woman, which is an A plus in my book, and she loves cakes and cookies, which is an A plus plus in my book, but she's able to take the complicated world of online privacy and analytics and break them down in a fun and engaging way where techies and novices can truly understand. I had a great time talking to April Wilson, and I hope you enjoyed as well. So without further ado, here's my conversation with April Wilson from Digital Analytics 101.com. Okay, we're talking to April Wilson. How are you today? I'm great. How are you doing? I am fine. You know, I just came off your Pinterest board, uh, your Wonder Woman Pinterest board, which was fantastic. i never seen so many I, Wonder Woman pictures. Uh, some of the cosplay costumes out there are so amazing. I'm a huge Wonder Woman fan. Yes, where did that come from? Uh, the old Linda Carter TV show. I grew up with that, and it was just always a fixation for me. Now, I was looking at some of the pictures, so I didn't see you as Wonder Woman. So is there a Wonder Woman picture of April Wilson on that board? No, those pictures are largely unpublished. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it, it kind of goes into what we're talking about today because I, I think there's some place where you said uh, you're such a big fan of Wonder Woman that your lasso of truth is data. Yes. Yes. And the story that I came across that I heard on, on video, which is fantastic, is that you came into data because of a sex education troupe in college. That's right. I, uh, I used to run my own sex education company back in uh, college, and the whole shtick was uh, students talking to students. And when I got to be a certain age and couldn't pass for 18 anymore, I sold that business and uh, moved into the analytics field. But, yes, that's actually how I got started. And for people who really don't understand analytics fully, because there's, there's a lot of people who hear about analytics, but they really don't understand it. So in, like, in the simplest form possible, what's your best description of analytics? I think the analogy that I can make that most people can relate to the best is I think at some point in our lives we've all tried to go on a diet for whatever reason. Maybe it was a special occasion, maybe our pants were just getting too tight, maybe we wanted to live a healthier lifestyle, whatever it happens to be. And you think of all of the components that go into that, so understanding your caloric intake, setting your goals. Are you trying to just slim down or are you also trying to build muscle? Is there an aerobic or exercise component? Uh, how much are you currently eating? What's your goal target? Um, are you going to give yourself cheat days and things like that? All of those inputs, that, that's the data. And then what you're trying to accomplish with that as you start to set out to achieve your goal, you're always looking at the data to monitor how you're doing against your goal. And that's really all analytics is. It's really finding the right data to use to achieve your goal and monitoring it or using it to create forecasts. But it's all very similar. So most people are like, oh, that's it, because otherwise it sounds so nebulous, and it really isn't. And you did something interesting. You used analytics for Super Bowl party. You had onion dips. You had people testing which dip as an analytics experiment. So how did that turn out? Uh, I tested two dips. I tested the uh, Lipton onion soup dip that you make with the sour cream, and then I tested the store-bought hell of a good ranch dip. And actually, the classic Lipton onion soup dip, I put them both in identical bowls. They looked the same. I placed them both by the chips and the veggies, and the onion soup outperformed the hell of a good store-bought brand. Uh, store -bought, I can't talk. Store-bought brand. There we go. So how did you present it? Did you say, hey, everybody, before we get into the game, <laughs> I want you to try this dip? Or uh, or did you just stop the game and say, okay, we need to do this right now because I need to find out which dip is better? No, I did what any good researcher would do. I didn't let the subjects know that they were being tested. So I just sort of casually put it all out and made it look like the dip was divvied evenly into two different bowls. But there was a difference, and my guests did not know that. But I just sort of watched to see which ones did well and which ones didn't. So it was, like a, it was like a blind test? It was. It was like a blind test. They didn't even know. Okay. So the reason I wanted to talk to you today, because I could talk to you about Wonder Woman and dip all day. <laughs> but the reason I wanted to talk to you, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about uh, privacy and data. And it's been a year since Target had their data breach. So from a privacy and data standpoint, 
what improvements have you seen since Target it went through that horrible controversy where people's information was uh, hijacked? I think that that's going to be an ongoing and persistent problem because as our security systems get more stringent, more tight, I mean, it's not just unique to Target. I believe Chase had an incident pretty recently. I know Home Depot had an incident pretty recently. And I work in healthcare, so we're always patching based on the latest viruses, hacks, and spyware. It, it, it's just as the data protocols get more sophisticated, so too do the hackers. And I think that the onus is on us as businesses and brands to really make it transparent and clear to the consumer or, because I'm in healthcare right now, the patient or the guarantor to let them know, here's the data that we collect, here's what we use it for, this is why we're doing it. We secure it to the best of our abilities. Like in our industry, we have a lot of regulations around PCI compliance, around HIPAA. There's a whole bevy of other privacy regulations in place for other industries. So I've also been in credit card. I think of Sarbanes-Oxley. There's regulations, and most of the folks that use data or store data on a daily basis to do their business, it's a constant safeguard and struggle. It's always top of mind. How secure is this facility? How secure is my database? How secure are the algorithms that encrypt and protect my customer's data? That's across the board. But I think, honestly, Kevin, the biggest deal right now when it comes to data and privacy is not necessarily um, – evil hackers that are trying to get out there and steal your identity or your money. I think that's always going to be a persistent risk, but I don't think it's significantly different than walking down a street corner in an unfamiliar neighborhood and worrying that you're going to get mugged, right? I think that there's there are risks that are part of everyday life that we just have to accept, whether that's digital data or whether that's just physical safety. But I do think that a lot of companies and a lot of brands really don't do a very good job of explaining what data they house, what data they capture, what data they resell if they're part of a larger, larger data aggregate. Um, I, I know for most of the folks that I talk to, I teach a class. I haven't taught it in a while, but uh, on digital marketing and how the data is captured behind the scenes. And I find that most of my students are utterly stunned at the amount of personal data that is collected from them on a daily basis that they're volunteering but they don't even realize it's being captured. So I, I just think that, I mean, especially when it comes to any particular social media brands, and I'm not just singling out Facebook, I think the onus is on Pinterest as well. I think the onus is on Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Flickr, Tumblr, you name it. Anytime that there is a medium in which people – are sharing information about themselves, whether that's a 120-character tweet or whether that's a longer blog post with embedded videos, that they need to understand how that data is being used and resold and really empower folks to do more so that in the case that there is a breach, if I'm doing business with Facebook and they have my credit card on file because I purchased a gift for somebody, I know exactly what the risks are, how long they've stored it. There's a quick and easy to understand notification system in the event that something does go wrong. But again, I think transparency is probably the biggest risk when it comes to privacy and data. So if I'm a patient, I'm going to a hospital and I'm, you know, I want to protect my information, but I have to give out a lot of information. So, you know, so you know a lot about me. Is there something I need to check for so my information don't go out? Or does the hospital does that automatically? That's a great question. It's really interesting because that's a landscape that's in the middle of huge changes right now. Uh, I, I know we've all heard about our electronic health record. If you've been to the doctor, the dentist, the hospital, your local physician, um, you may have noticed that they'll come and take your information 100% electronically now, or at least they, they should be. Um, and there are, the burden is on them to do what's known as meaningful use so that all the data that's captured about your visit, your history, um, that it can all go into a central data repository, for lack of a better term. Some of them are statewide, some of them are network-wide, so if all of your physicians are part of a larger hospital system network, for example. Um, there's, there's different clusters of how that data is being used, but that they'll share across the board of what you had done at one facility so that if 
something goes wrong and you show up at a different facility, they have full access to all of your data. Now, unless you're in some of the more progressive states, like I know that New York is working on a central patient portal that is statewide for any uh, licensed practitioners in the state, it's still in development. It's not live. It's not launched. But if you're a resident of the state of New York, um, you would have full access to not only your full medical record and all of your history, but who's accessed it. If somebody's accessed it, like one of your doctors, obviously nobody's going to access it without your permission because of HIPAA. But if, if somebody's accessing it, like if your family care physician accesses it and then your chiropractor accesses it because the two of them are talking to each other, that's the object of the game. That's that's a lot of the reason that the regulations have come down the way they have, encouraging um, physicians to really change all of their systems, all healthcare practitioners to change all of their systems to really leverage the electronic health record. So that's that's coming. You will be able to log in and check something. You will be able to get copies of everything you do. But right now, for most of the doctors and other healthcare practitioners that are out there, you're still going to only be able to access your own medical record at that facility as opposed to sort of the larger portrait of your overall health care. But that's coming, which I think is actually pretty darn cool. I think so. Because, I, you know, you hear horror stories about people who may be in a different state and they need a hospitalization and they have to uh, give, give their information. And they, and they might be incapacitated where they can't give out their information. So the fact that you have a, a database where your information is the same that makes the process move a lot faster is, is a great thing. Yes, and it's really cool, too, because there are a lot of apps that have sort of risen to fill that gap while we're waiting for all the data to align and plug in together. So I don't know if you've noticed if you have an iPhone or not, but on the latest release, I think it was 8.0, not the most recent, I think 8.1. But on 8.0, the new operating system now has a little iHealth icon that's part of it, and you can fill out any of your allergies, what medications you're currently on, and even if your phone is lost, an emergency responder can just sort of swipe up and see all of your main history so they don't shoot you up with penicillin if you're allergic to penicillin and accidentally kill you. Even if the person you're with, let's say you're on a first date or something, doesn't know your medical history, it's by default in a locked state available information on your phone. Now let's talk about the cloud a bit because there was a controversy a few months ago where, you know, those are Hollywood actresses had their had their cloud hacked and revealing a bunch of pictures. And the debate goes back and forth. But some people might say, well, you know, you should think before you post pictures up there because even though it's in the cloud, it can be hacked. But then at the same time, if you put it in the cloud and you have your password, you might, you might even change your password from time to time. You don't think that's going to happen to you. So how can people safeguard themselves if they put things in the cloud? It doesn't have to be photos, but maybe it could be documents or music or, or whatever. I mean, how can people protect themselves uh, from the cloud. So that comes back to the initial point of, you know, how is your data stored? How is it used? What are the risks associated with uploading any content that you create? And bless those little actors and actresses' hearts. Uh, I believe it's called the fappening is what you're referencing. But right. they actually, their cloud data, most of them, I want to say like 70% of the folks whose images were exposed, no pun intended, um, those folks, it wasn't their phones that were vulnerable. It was folks that they had sent that information to, like they had texted those photos, uh, and it was their iCloud accounts that were hacked for the most part. So it's just, we, we, it's just ridiculous to have any expectation whatsoever of privacy for content that you create. I guess it's the bottom line of what I try to really hammer across to everybody that I talk to. If you create it and you post it anywhere, even if you're just saving it to your Dropbox or you're saving it to your Google Drive or your box.com, it, it's, still, it's still public domain. One, one, it's not like writing in a diary that you hide under your bed. Only the folks that come into your house might have access to that. If you're creating it digitally and you're storing it digitally, even though from a terms of, of use perspective, uh, it's not public domain for all intents and purposes. That's always going to be that risk. It doesn't make it right, and it doesn't make it okay. And even if the folks that were victimized changed their passwords consistently, it wasn't 
from my understanding, and I, I will admit that I did very limited reading on the subject because to me it, it, it's just like the data breach all over again with Target and Home Depot and Chase. It's, when it's up there, it's exposed, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to download or look at those pictures because that's not my thing. Um, I don't. I, I know what it's like to have your privacy hacked, and so I tend to steer away from peeking into other people's business that have been in a similar unfortunate situation. But so what happened in your case? It's really it's not an exciting and or glamorous story. There's no real high drama to it. It, it was just a case of basic identity theft. Somebody got hold of my credit card information, and then they got hold of my social. So. Um, they attempted to rack up a whole lot of expensive items under my name, and I now am a proud subscriber, and they don't pay me to say this, to LifeLock, and on all of my credit cards, I always make sure to have the uh, credit card protection plan above and beyond the basic terms of service. So it's nothing its nothing dramatically exciting. It's just, um, again, you're just out there in the world charging, and all of a sudden you get a, you get a phone call like, hi, are you, I think you're in Florida right now, but it looks like you're buying a lot of gas right now in California. Is that you? No, that's right. not me. So, it's not exciting. But it's just, I think I'm a little more sensitive to, it, sensitive to it than other folks because I am in the data industry, so. Were the banks quick on this when it comes to identity theft, or were they kind of slow and now they finally caught up where they're really fully active in trying to help people when it comes to identity theft? I actually started my career in analytics working for a bank. So this one I actually know pretty well because I was in the risk and fraud department, and that was back in 98. So it's been they've been on top of it for quite a while, and it's typically a, a type of modeling known as neural net modeling where you're looking for associations between groups of behavior. So even if you go to the movies every Friday night, and it's usually you purchase two tickets and two popcorns and two drinks, and then all of a sudden one Friday night, instead of going to see a rated R movie like you always do, you pick a G-rated family film and you're purchasing 12 popcorns and 12 drinks, that's going to flag somebody's fraud detection because it's the type of purchase that you've never made before. So it's even if you've spent there in that location at that time on that day before, they're just looking for any sort of variances in that behavior. It, it behaves like the synapses of your brain. So when you make an association like, oh, April, April showers, is it going to rain tomorrow? I need an umbrella. I didn't buy an umbrella. Those sorts of sort of tangential connections that you make, that's the kind of modeling that sits behind the scenes for most fraud detection algorithms. And it's, it's really pretty cool stuff. I kind of geeked out on you right there because that, that's kind of my sweet spot. So I apologize if that was a little PMI, but I think it's you really geek, great, the fraud detection stuff. You can geek out as much as you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, let's talk about behavioral patterns for a second because but people want privacy. I understand that. You want privacy. But at the same time, they have to analyze your behavioral patterns. So they can call you on this because they have to analyze it. So what's the process when your behavioral patterns are followed? It's pretty much real time. So every transaction that processes in real time, they're sending that data back to your financial institution, and they're running you through an algorithm to detect whether or not that's likely to be you, which is why when you get a bank that's really on top of things, they'll call you within two minutes of the activity that they're suspicious of. I mean, it, it happens really fast. Most of it's automated. I've just read something in Forbes magazine where a guy wrote that people say they want privacy, but they're not private. You know, they don't change the passwords like they should. They put pictures all over the place. They let people know where they're at when it comes to Foursquare. They say, hey, I'm at this location. So do you think people care about privacy, but they don't do enough to kind of secure their privacy? I think, again, it's a basic education issue around what gets shared and used against you and what is just sort of benign data that sits out there in the Internet not being used by anybody for anything. I, I don't think it's privacy that they want so much as they want anonymity. We want to be found when fabulous personalities like you want to interview us and it's really thrilling that you found my Pinterest board and you found the old fast video and that maybe you found the video of me when I was really fat. I don't know, but that's okay. I'm all right with that. been doing this and teaching for a really long time, but at the same time, 
I make sure that I don't share pictures of me in a Wonder Woman costume with any website or any digital cloud application. It's just more of a, yeah, I still got it kind of thing. But it's for my own use, and I don't store it anywhere. So uh, I think we want to be anonymous in certain situations. We have the expectation that we are not logged, in fact, and that it's got all of the I guess personal association is driving through a toll booth. But the reality is even when you drive through a toll booth, they know you're making model. They might know whether it's a male or female driver, depending on whether or not they have facial recognition software running in that toll booth plaza. If you have a toll tag, they know exactly who you are or they know exactly who the vehicle is registered to. I mean, there's a whole host of information that gets captured. But... I think when people think of data, they think of Gallup polls or they think of Nielsen families where a lot of data is anonymously captured and then aggregated back up. But the object of the game right now for any company when it comes to analytics is to get to that nirvana of one-on-one. I'm only going to talk to Kevin about super awesome things that he gets really excited about, clicks on, purchases, and then talks to all his friends about. Like, that's that's where people want to get to. So everything that you do, every mouse click, where you hover your mouse before you click, um, how often you come back to the site, whether you're looking at it on your desktop or mobile or both, I mean, all of these things are all part of the reality that we're living. And I just think that the average person has no idea that when you download an app like one of the group texting applications, for example, what they're doing is they're capturing all of your texts and they're reselling those to advertisers. So they not only have access to everything that you text using their app, but because it's an app that sits on your phone, they have access to everything in your uh, photo library, everything in your video, video library, everything in your contact database, how often you're roaming versus in network, how often um, you place phone calls. So all of the data that gets captured on your mobile device, most apps have access to that, and most people have no idea that that happens. But then when you read articles like in Advertising Age, for example, that the Darth Vader Volkswagen commercial generated more buzz within the first 60 minutes, that's one of the data sources that they're using for that article. Volkswagen's paying to know who's texting about their ad. Above and beyond what's personally available on people's Facebook walls that don't have their privacy set right or Twitter or any of the public forums, like they're buying data about you from your apps about what's on your phone. I mean, that's just life. And I, again, I think most people are like, I had no idea how much of my daily life is tracked. And the answer is, if, unless you live in the woods and you burn wood for fuel, pretty much all of it is. Yeah, because I saw something on 60 Minutes last year, I think, where you can just go to a simple website and all these third-party places from a behavioral standpoint just snaps up your profile and just looks at all your, your patterns and all that type of stuff. But, yeah, people have no idea. It doesn't matter if you download an app or go to a website. Even if you set all your privacy settings, mm-hmm. somewhere, some way, somewhere, your data is going to end up someplace. It's just that's just the world we live in right now. Yes. And I don't think you were fed in that video. You, you were very charming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Like, why did I wear that outfit? There's one where I'm talking about critical thinking, but this makes me feel sad deep inside. Not that there's anything wrong with people who are larger. I'm not judging. I'm just saying for me, that particular ensemble was not the most flattering on camera, and I would have chosen something totally different if I realized I was going to be videotaped. <laughs> I didn't know my data was going to be captured. There you go. That's true. But see, I, I didn't even focus on that. I focused on a couple of things. I focused on your glasses. And it's like, okay, those are unique. Thank you. <laughs> and I focused on what you were saying because you, usually when I'm listening to some analytic people, I kind of doze off. But you were very, <laughs> like, you were just like, you know, it's kind of like, well, this is my story. And you're just very bubbly and it's just relatable. It's like, oh, okay, she kind of breaks the stuff down where I can kind of understand what she's saying. So, yeah. Thank you. I did for read the story of how you, how, when you, it was, because I guess you've been wearing glasses for a long time. And uh, back in the day, you signed autographs as Lisa Loeb. <laughs> so, I did, yes. How did, how, did, how did that happen? They just they just come up to you like, oh, my God, it's Lisa Loeb. Okay, when, when she was really popular, so now you have a rough idea of what age I am, 
Um, I went out to a lot of different bars. Not that I have an alcohol problem, nor did I at that particular point in time, but evidently we looked enough alike that I would constantly, constantly, for about a two-month period, get asked to sign autographs. And instead of going, I'm not Lisa Loeb, which I tried on several occasions unsuccessfully, I just decided to swim with the current. I'm like, all right, give me that pen. <laughs> Let's autograph some things. Did you just say love Lisa or uh <laughs> to my number one fan, Lisa. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. So do you ever turn off the analytical part of you? Because it seems like everything I read, you're, you're almost like 24-7, you're always analytical. But is there any time you shut that off and just do anything like karaoke or something where it's just not nothing analytical, you just bake or cook or something where you just don't even think about it? I do cook. Cook in the big um Cooking is a big thing for me because, A, I'm a Southern girl, and, B, no matter how chaotic life gets, in the kitchen you can pretty much always master your domain. Like, unless you lose electricity or one of your ingredients has expired, pretty much nine times out of ten, whatever you create will be magnificent. So I do love to cook, but I love what I do. I'm, I'm if you, Like, it's not that different than, like, maybe I'm – Somebody really famous like Meatloaf. Maybe I'm a, a good uh, – see, because you talked about the kitchen, and now I'm hungry, and I thought of Meatloaf, the rock artist. But, like, it's like musicians love what they do. They play music 24-7. Um, athletes love what they do. They train 24-7. And I love what I do. And I, the thing that's beautiful and hideous all at the same time about digital data is that the landscape changes all the time. It's not like teaching algebra. Algebra has been algebra has been algebra for hundreds of years. But telling somebody what's going to be successful about their website could be completely different this week than it was last week because life just changes that fast in my space. And I love what I do. I love it. And I love teaching people about it and I love talking about it. And even my four children to some extent that are 10 and 12 I mean, we test everything. That's my first question whenever they, you know, come back to me with, do we have to have meatloaf for dinner tonight? Can we have something else? I'm like, what else would you like to test? And if it involves going to McDonald's, the answer is no. Um, but if there's something else here that we could possibly be making, let's do it as a team. So I just, I love what I do. I could tell. Are you still involved with the uh, analytics exchange? I am. I'm actually not on any active projects right now. I took some time off. Oh, that's another thing that I do. I just finished uh, Nano Remo. Do you know what that is? I do not. Okay, it's it's short for National Novel Writing Month. This is my fourth year doing it, and every November, hundreds of thousands of people across the world try to write a fifty thousand word book in thirty days. So for the last thirty days, I've been diligently writing a book, which. I'm happy to say I am a winner, like I got to 51,000 words, but my book is probably only like halfway done, and I write embarrassing, trashy fiction, not like Fifty Shades of Grey, not not, not that level, but oh. it's, it's more like Twilight, except that makes it sound like there's vampires, which isn't really necessarily true, but it's just... That's how I turn off my math brain and, and nurture my creative brain as I write. So I, I usually save up for November. So I'm, I'm not part of the analysis exchange at the moment. I'm, I'm still a mentor in the program. I just I don't have any active projects right now. So are, is this going to be a book that you're going to put out, or is this something that uh, you're just writing? I just write them to write them. It's kind of, I guess, like people who train to run a marathon just to know that they can run it. It's not because they want to, like, compete or win a medal. I just do it to, to say that I do it. Uh, I have let friends and family read some of the books that I've written, but... Um, for the most part, it's, they're not necessarily for distribution, and I guess they could be, but they're not. They could be. You could you could do it as an alias. You can just put it out, one of them out there as an alias, and see what happens. And, you know, that's true. That's, that's true. I could. That's how J.K. Rowling got started. So. Is it? I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, she it was J.K. I think because I, I don't I don't know the full story. I think because you know she didn't want people to know. So she just, just had J.K. And I think most people thought it was a guy who did it. So, mm-hmm. you know, just put it out there and became a hit. So, you know, you could you could be a, a best-selling novelist who's in between Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm trying to figure out. 
on the scale <laughs> where, that, where that is. Because that's like, okay, it's somewhere in the middle someplace. So here's the embarrassing thing is that I keep setting out consistently every single year to write like this really cool interstellar-ish science fiction novel. And what keeps mm -hmm. coming out of me are these sappy romance novels. I don't know what my problem is. <laughs> That's what comes out. It's not like a Fabio ripping his shirt off when it's like those romance novels. It's more of a Hallmark movie of the week level of uh, anyways. No, I don't know if I'll publish them because I'm still kind of embarrassed by them. But they're good. They're just kind of, like, sappy. Why are you embarrassed? Like, sappy, sappy sales. People love those Hallmark movies. I know. <laughs> they, I people know. love sappy romance stuff. <laughs> well, I love I sappy romance stories. stuff. <laughs> well, I got some stories for you. <laughs> I can't wait. If you ever put out one of these books, you know, I, I'm going to have to talk to you again. Okay. And I said, wow, this is really sappy. But, but I like it. <laughs> All right, April. Well, thank you for the conversation. If people want to learn more about you and what you do, where can they go? Uh, I would point them to start at my website, digitalanalytics101.com, or I have a personal kind of landing page website, aprilwilson.net. So either one of those places. But if you Google April Wilson Analytics, you'll find me. I'm all over the first couple pages. You know, I do a lot of research when I interview people. And you're right, there's not like a whole lot out there about you. Even though you're like deep in the technology and analytics, there's stuff out there about you, but it's not a whole lot of stuff. So it's almost like you keep things kind of private. Your business stuff is out there, but nothing about you too personal is out there. So you're actually doing it the right way. Yes, I am. I'm in, in the field of analytics, I'm the most famous, not famous person you'll ever meet. Nobody's heard of me, but then they realize who I run with and what I do, and they're like, why are you not famous? Because I'm not. <laughs> see, I can see you on MasterChef. I can see you saying, I'm a visual analytic person, and I love to cook. <laughs> and I can see you wowing the judges with some southern dish. Oh, I love it. The worse that it is for my waistline, the more that I love to eat it. It's terrible, but it's so delicious. What's your go-to dish? Um, my go-to dish is usually a pot roast. Like, I'm a, I'm a good old-fashioned southern pot roast kind of girl, but what I'm known for, if you worked with me 24-7, is that I bake. So whenever the world gets too much to bear, I will make cookies, cakes, or bread. And so I bring in a lot of carbs to my office. And they all say, you're fattening me up. And I'm like, that's right. And when there's a fire, <laughs> I'm going to run, and you guys are going to be slower. <laughs> They'll be waddling out the door. We can't get past the cake. <laughs> so what's the last cake you cooked? Um, actually, the last thing I made was Christmas cookies. So I, are you familiar with, like, the little spritz cookie gun? I am. I, so I'm trying to find the perfect spritz recipe. So I've made a couple of different batches. And I want one that's kind of buttery but also really soft. Like, I don't want it to be all crispy. And then I want to dip half of it in chocolate. So I've been experimenting with a couple of different recipes there. I have not yet found the one that I love. But when I do, I will send it to you. Thank you, April. You're welcome. Oh, one last analytic privacy data thing before we go. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the future of privacy and data is for the next year or so? Well, I think probably what's going to wind up happening is just continued refinement and targeting of your digital experience based on your behaviors. I think behavioral analytics is going to continue to be the the force that sits behind everything that you're exposed to, whether that's on your mobile device, your desktop, your iPad, your laptop, the ATM, whatever it happens to be, any kind of digital interface that you're used to, what happens at the grocery store when you check out, for example. I think there's a risk. I think maybe there's a 20% chance. It's a small risk, but it's still significant. So people are going to get up at arms about the way that their data is used and ask for stronger regulations, like what happened over in the EU a few years ago, that any site that cookies a user has to fully disclaim that at the very beginning of the website experience, and people should be able to opt out if they want to. I think that that's a risk, but honestly, I think when it comes to privacy and data, that genie's out of the bottle. Pandora's box has been opened, and the demons have come out, and I think it's going to be very hard to put them back in. So I think instead of a tide that you can fight against, it's more of a how are you going to swim with the current situation, both as a consumer and as a brand. I think that's that's the future. 
from an education standpoint, if there's one thing that I like to hammer home, it's your perception of the data that's out there in the news, what you hear on your news feed on Facebook, what you see on Twitter, what happens when you Google somebody, what happens when you say, Siri, tell me more about April Wilson. That kind of experience is highly filtered and highly tailored to what you have done in the past. So you only see about 30% of the folks that you're Facebook friends with content in your news feed. They filter it. If you want to see everything that somebody posts, you have to go directly to their page. Otherwise, you're not going to see it. And I think that that's something that a lot of folks don't realize either. So I think it will continue to be targeted and filtered down based on what they think you're going to respond to. You think of yourself as a large rat in a big maze, and they constantly want you to get to the cheese. They're going to continue to tailor your experience in that way. But as long as everybody understands that that's not reality, and sometimes you have to turn it off, and sometimes you have to browse privately, and sometimes um, – you need not, I don't recommend clearing your cookies. I'm a big fan of cookies. I bake. But I also think cookies are good because they do store some of your settings and, and your preferences, and that's a good thing. But I think as long as we all understand that that's not real, that's only a fraction of the story that's out there, we'll be okay. But I think it's just going to continue to get filtered even further. That's good stuff. Well, thanks a lot, April, and I'll be looking forward to my cookies and cakes. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. I want to thank April Wilson for being a great guest on The Digital Life. Make sure you follow her company, Digital Analytics 101.com. That's Digital Analytics 101.com. And also be sure to follow her on Twitter at April Wilson. That's at April Wilson, as well as AprilWilson.net. Before I go, I have a Twitter question for you. Tweet me at Camelocket and tell me your thoughts on online privacy. Use the hashtag AprilKL. That's AprilKL. And tell me your thoughts on online privacy. All right, everybody. It's the Digital Life. I'm Kevin Lockett, and I'm out. The Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. 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 Lockett.